The following program is a color feature presentation on the Hughes Sports Network. This Week in Pro Football is brought to you by Hager, the Slacks people. We make everybody look good. And by the 1972 Buick, something to believe in. In New Orleans, it was a very good year for the Grapes of Wrath. Gumbo fans were all too tired of the bitter wine of ignominy. And when Cleveland came to town, having already clinched a division title, there were hopes for another upset, but things went askew. Good defense forced good field position. And Bo Scott plugged in the game's first score for the Cleveland Browns. Cleveland began a slapstick sequence that left the Saints close, but with no cigar. Number 47, Virgil Robinson, controlled the free-floating football and swept into the end zone for the Saints' first touchdown. And late in the fourth period, Archie Manning initiated a four-play scoring drive. Jim Strong punched past some good blocks and scored the Saints' second touchdown. But it was not enough as an interference call on Hugo Hollis set up this one-yard score by Leroy Kelly for the Browns' second score. And a third touchdown came when Turkey Jones gobbled Archie up, leaving the ball loose for Walter Johnson to fall on in the end zone. The Browns prevailed despite a sloppy game, 21 to 17. At Shea Stadium, Jet Partisans assembled for a shootout between two of the best rifles in the league. New England sharpshooter Jim Plunkett has thrown 17 touchdown passes and had Patriot fans saying, Joe who? Joe Namath, that's who. And the return of his shotgun is reloaded to Jet offense. Most Jet fans hoped Namath would show Plunkett a thing or two, but the Jet defense did most of the teaching. The Jets sacked Plunkett four times, and seven times they made him scramble. Then they scrambled him. If nothing else, Plunkett learned the fake left, fake right, and hit it move. Although Big Jim unlimbered his launcher with some aesthetic looking passes, he could not crack the Jets secondary for a touchdown. W.K. Hicks was the stopper on this one. For the day, Plunkett managed 18 completions and 31 tries, but could move the Pats to only two field goals. The Jets matched those points, but Namath spirals met the same fate as Plunkett's, and Joe didn't throw a touchdown pass either.
Larry Carwell stopped one threat, and when Namath got close again, Ed Bell had his pocket picked by an outlaw. John Outlaw, number 44. The only touchdown of the game was not set up by Namath or Plunkett, but by the Jet defense. Carl Garrett, number 30, had the ball swiped by Al Atkinson, number 62. And Phil Wise's recovery got the ball to the one. On the next play, John Riggins, number 44, dove in for the margin of victory. Jet fans drove home safely, content that their Jets had driven to a third-place tie with New England in the AFC East. A proud tradition of pro football in Baltimore stretches across four NFL championships. An integral part of that tradition is Don Shula, who directed four division winners for the Colts. Now he's coach of the division-leading Miami Dolphins. Shula affects the Colt dynasty in a different way. Confronting Shula were two relics from his past, a bandy-legged old quarterback named John Unitas and a one-owner running back with plenty of mileage named Tom Matty. Shula had watched the two control a game before, and now he was the victim. The cold time machine ground out 39 first-half plays to Miami 17 as Unitas mounted two nine-minute drives and Matty culminated each for a 14-0 cold advantage. Then the cold and calculating cold defense took cue and it quickly stretched its icy fingers to the heart of the Dolphin attack. Number 42, Paul Warfield, is a mercurial moment which must be captured to control the Dolphins. The Colts contained Miami's Quicksilver and then went after the Dolphins' showbiz act. Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid combined for only 17 first half yards as the Colts manhandled any running back without a blue jersey. Freelance runner number 21, Jeremy Pivot, managed to pick up two tough yards. But the no-nonsense Baltimore boys were taking the fun out of everybody's game. And they went after Dolphin Golden Boy, Bob Greasy, to finalize their death grip. Greasy threw two fourth-quarter interceptions, the second to number 56, Ray May as Baltimore vaulted back into the division lead with a 14-3 domination of the Dolphins. Already in 1971, Don Shula had watched his present team win 17-14 in Miami, and his former team now win 14-3 in Baltimore. Now both teams have clinched playoff bursts and perhaps the next chapter of the intriguing past and present of Don Shula will take place in the AFC Championship. A high draft choice has meant a lot to the Bills and Oilers as both teams' future success rests on early round picks at quarterback. Number 16, Dennis Shaw, was Rookie of the Year last season, but he and the rest of the Bills have suffered through a one-win season this year. The Oilers used this Willie Alexander interception and a short drive to set up two first-half field goals. And in the second half, Ken Houston ran the count to 13 to nothing. Houston's seventh career touchdown return tied him with Herb Adderley and Erich Barnes as the all-time leaders. And the Bills seem certain of the league's first draft pick. The Bills have had great success with first-round picks, and they use their most recent ones to fight back. Shaw teamed with 1971 number one pick J.D. Hill to spark a drive. 
And 1969 number one pick O.J. Simpson did a three cushion bank into the end zone. There haven't been many touchdowns for O.J. Simpson this season, so he graciously congratulated everybody, including Houston's Elvin Buffet, number 65. Then with less than two minutes left, Shaw spotted Haven Moses in the corner, and the Bills led 14 to 13. The lead had Buffalo's number one pick in jeopardy, but if they ever drafted according to ability to be overjoyed, the Bills need look no further than Moses. Houston quarterback Dan Pastorini is also a number one pick and showed why high choices are so valuable when he ignored the Buffalo rush and hit Jim Byrne for 41 yards. Pastorini moved the Oilers 78 yards in 91 seconds. And then with 24 seconds left, Robert Holmes bounced in to put Houston back on top 20 to 14. Houston had their third win and Buffalo had clinched the right to draft first. Another good selection will greatly enhance the Bills' chance to get back on the winning track. For Cincinnati coach Paul Brown, this has perhaps been his most disappointing season. And last week, the heartaches continued as Pittsburgh took a 7-0 lead on Terry Hanratty's sweep for a touchdown. The Bengals have been ravaged by injuries this year, and rarely has the young, aggressive defense been in top physical condition. When the Bengals are healthy, they are tough. An oft-injured Mike Reed, number 74, is one of the toughest. This jarring tackle caused a shoulder separation for Terry Hanratty and provided the fire for a Bengal comeback. Quarterback Virgil Carter paired up with rugged tight end Bruce Coslett, number 88, to lead Cincinnati to their first touchdown. A Carter scramble, a short toss, and an all-out effort by Coslett nodded the score at seven. One of the most consistent Bengal performers has been number 20, Lamar Parrish, whose dodging, weaving run set up one of two Horst Muhlman field goals that put Cincinnati on top, 13-7. But then number 12, Terry Bradshaw entered the game and led a fourth quarter Steeler charge. Bradshaw's touchdown pass to John Fuqua, number 33, put Pittsburgh on top, 14-13, and put the pressure on Cincinnati's quarterback, Virgil Carter. With time running out, Carter had to put the ball in the air. And the Steelers' number 49, rookie defensive back Ralph Anderson, was ready and waiting. The interception ruined the Bengals' hopes and set up the final Pittsburgh score. A five-yard shot from Bradshaw to number 25, Ron Shanklin. For the Steelers, the 21-13 win clinched second place behind Cleveland in the AFC Central. But for the hard luck Bengals, it was just one more loss in a difficult season. The San Diego football chargers, that classic case of athletic schizophrenia, continue to confuse the experts. Last week, they actually put it all together for the second week in a row. The AFC Western Division race has its twists and turns. San Diego whipped the Chiefs to open the season, then were demolished by Oakland. Denver lost to everybody, then beat the Chargers. But by December, everything straightens out as annually Oakland plays Kansas City for first and the Chargers play Denver for last. 
The Broncos looked like good bets in this year's basement bowl as number 44, Floyd Little, pushed his yardage over the 1,000 mark. But San Diego had a record of five straight third-place finishes to protect, and John Hadel came out gunning. The ghost, Gary Garrison, glided 77 yards with one Hadel flip as the hot and cold running chargers found all systems go. Rookie Chuck Dykus, number 28, came up with his first pro touchdown, and Hadel continued to mine the mother load by unveiling number 47, Jeff Queen. The unobtrusive young running back was very, very open in the first half, and even more so in the second. Perhaps the Broncos thought that Queen was still a linebacker, his original position with the Chargers. But after 140 total yards, Denver was convinced that he belonged on offense. Meanwhile, the Denver attack was getting desperate while trying to keep pace with the San Diego bombing run. Unfortunately, a pass reception on one bounce to an offensive guard is not allowed in the NFL. And the Broncos just faded away as John Hadle cranked it up to cruising speed and filled the air with footballs. was robbed of his third touchdown, but number 20, Mike Garrett, sliced in to continue the route. In all, it was a pretty fair country day for Kansas John as he went to the bench with 21 completions, 332 yards, and four touchdowns. Number 14, Marty Domres, and number 84, Walker Gillette, closed out the basement bowl as San Diego added a 45-17 blowout to their already bittersweet season and clinched third place in the AFC West for the sixth straight time. Why well, John Hadle has to be one of the most underrated quarterbacks in history, Pat? Part of the reason I think he's underrated is that the AFC West has a couple of other old pro quarterbacks who play for more consistent teams. And last week in Kansas City, they went head-to-head -head for the division championship. The Kansas City Chiefs had not won a division title since 1966, when they were the AFL's first Super Bowl team. Since then, their fiercest rivals, the Oakland Raiders, had won four straight Western Division titles. But last week, the Chiefs drew first blood with a Lynn Dawson touchdown pass to Otis Taylor, pro football's top yardage receiver. In the early going, the Oakland attack consisted mainly of a Daryl LaMonica handoff to Marv Hubbard, who loves to run against the Chiefs. For the most part, LaMonica was ineffective, and each of the Chiefs' front four relished taking a shot at him. Trailing 10-0 with 416 to go in the first half, LaMonica was derricked, and in came an old guy who had been there before. 44-year-old George Blanda immediately marched the Raiders to their first touchdown, which came on a sweep by Marv Hubbard. With eight seconds left in the half, Lynn Dawson threw to Dennis Holman to stop the clock. But Holman almost scored and almost used up the clock. With just one second left, the Chiefs got a field goal and had 13 to seven at the half. Early in the second half, Buck Buchanan handled Blanda like anything but the priceless antique that he is. But old George was far from finished. Cooling the rush with his deft screen passes to Marv Hubbard, Blanda again moved the Raiders goalward. On the first play of the fourth quarter, Blanda threw for Rod Sherman, but Johnny Robinson interfered. From the one, Hubbard scored again, and the Raiders were on top 14 to 13. Then with five minutes to play, third and 10 from his own seven, 
Lynn Dawson went for Otis Taylor in one of the game's key plays. Three more passes to Otis Taylor had the ball on the Oakland 41. And from there occurred another of the game's big plays. Jim Warren, number 20, was charged with interference. And after three running plays, Jan Stinnerud put the Chiefs back in front 16 to 14 with a minute and a half to play. A minute and a half for George Blanna to work his magic, but this was to be Kansas City's day to cheer. Jim Kearney intercepted a fourth down desperation pass, and Hank Stram's Chiefs had won the West from the Raiders for the first time in five years. For the Chiefs, a real cause for celebration. For the Raiders, a time to ponder an unbelievably abrupt conclusion to an unsuccessful run for a pro football's championship. This season, Joe Morrison passed Frank Gifford to become the all-time leading pass receiver of the New York Giants. Many of you are probably asking, so who's Joe Morrison? Well, it's true, he's no superstar and no Broadway flash, but what he is, is the kind of man that on or off the field gives only his best and most unselfish effort. For Joe Morrison and men like him, there's just no other way. Every Sunday, they fill stadiums from coast to coast. They come to see their superstars, their superheroes. Men whose names and numbers are familiar to the most casual fan. Men like O.J. Simpson, whose legend began in college and followed him to professional ball. Men like Lance Allworth, whose graceful style and God-given talent have made his name a household word. And men like Gail Sayers, whose greatness is such that his number is frozen in the mind of anyone who ever saw him play. In New York, there is another number 40. His name is Joe Morrison. He's not a superstar, yet he's symbolic of those men who since the beginning have been the soul and sinew of the sport. In 12 years, he's played six positions for the Giants. All of them well, but nothing has come easy. I think I recognize I don't have the ability that possibly a lot of other people in the league have. So you have to make up for it through pride and desire and uh, wanting to get the job done. And this is what I try and do with what I got. Joe Morrison does make do with what he's got. But as is his nature, he shares the credit. I think any runner, regardless of the speed, has to depend on those people up front to block for him or he's not going to go anywhere. Once you get through the line, then I think there is a lot of individual effort and you can make use of your individual abilities but primarily I think knowing what your offensive line is doing is probably the most important thing to a running back. Yes the blockers help but Joe Morris and the running back gets an A when it comes to individual effort. As a receiver he lacks the speed of jet streak burners like Bob Hayes. In fact his speed is sometimes the butt of jokes and one wonders how he ever manages to get open. How do I manage to get open? There's a lot of times I don't manage <laughs> to get open. Well, my speed uh, is not going to scare anyone, that's for sure. But I think you can go back to some of the great people that we've had on this ball club in the past, and that's the Kyle Roach and the Frank Giffords. Looking at these people and taking their moves and adapting them to your abilities, uh, I think this has helped tremendously even in running pass patterns today because they they knew the game they were very knowledgeable and they had great patterns and Kyle wasn't or Frank either wasn't the uh, fastest individual in the league so they made use of moves and patterns and uh, knowledge of the defense not only trying to beat a man but trying to beat a defense again he's willing to share the credit but when he's out there two or three steps behind the defender making the great catch the credit can only go to Joe Morrison's determination to succeed. In 1969, he led the Giants in rushing and receiving. 
Yet for him, these accomplishments weren't important. For he's a man who does not revel in the thrill of personal success. For him, the thrills of football are above the personal level. My greatest thrill, and I think you have to say thrills, because being a member of the New York Giants, playing in Yankee Stadium, playing with all the great people that they've had here in the past, and I think beating Cleveland after being born and raised in that territory, you always get a special thrill or a kick out of beating the Cleveland Browns. In 1969, the last game of the season was against the Browns. The Giants were decided underdogs, but they wanted to win badly, especially number 40. And on that day, as always, Joe Morrison rose to the occasion. He caught, he ran, he inspired his teammates. Single-handedly, he demolished the Browns. Joe Morrison has given much to pro football, and it makes one wonder what he will ask of the sport when he leaves it for good. I think I'd like to be remembered by my teammates. I think I would like to be respected by my teammates and by the people that I played against. I think there's a lot of things that enter into all of this, but I think if they would remember me as just a hustling ball player, I'd be happy. It will happen when the crowds have given their last cheer, when there is no time left in the game for Joe Morrison. Somewhere in Yankee Stadium, an echo will linger saying, there was a hustling ball player. Hopefully, a player like Joe Morrison will always be recognized for his efforts. In Green Bay last week, the Packer fans made sure one of their all-time favorites was duly recognized. If your name is Ray and you were in Green Bay last Sunday, you were in business. But the signs were for one Ray and only one. Ray Nitschke, the Packers Super Bowl middle linebacker, was being honored with a day. And in a tearful emotion packed ceremony, Ray received the thanks of all of his friends. Then in another tearful emotion packed ceremony, the Packers destroyed the Chicago Bears. The Bears and the Packers are pro football's oldest rivalry. And in what might have been his last start at Lambeau Field, Ray Nitschke flashed glimpses of his old brilliance. Packers, anxious to give their defense an early lead, scored on the very first play of the game. And you can't score much earlier than that. Scott Hunter to Carol Dale. But the Bears, who hadn't scored a touchdown in nearly a month, recovered a fumble and scored in one play when Kent Nix and George Farmer combined to leave the Packers dazed and confused. After that, however, the Bears were held in check. Jim Carter, number 50, intercepted a pass that might have gone all the way, but it was ruled down. So, thousand-yard rookie rusher John Brockington ran it in from the six and scored. Very near another sign of interest to Packer fans. Green Bay was never headed again as youth and experience provided an outstanding occasion for some of football's greatest fans. Elsewhere in the NFC Central, the Minnesota Vikings this season have been less than the purple powerhouse of the past. They've shown very little offense, usually winning by the skin of Fred Cox's big toe. But last week against Detroit, the Vikings forsook all offense, and like a purple anaconda, the people eaters wrapped themselves around the Lions and squeezed and squeezed leaving those cats from Detroit breathless and also lost. On a frozen, crystal cold day in Minnesota, the Vikings thawed their field with flamethrowers, as usual. 
but their thick-blooded fans came ready heated for the impending contest with the Detroit Lions. On the third play of the 13th game in the 1971 season, number 60, Roy Winston, picked off a Greg Landry pass and carried it 29 yards for the first score by the Viking defense this year. Last year, in 13 games, the Minnesota defense had registered seven touchdowns. But this was to be big D-Day for the Purple. Ed Shirokman soon intercepted another Landry aerial, setting up a Fred Cox field goal extending Cox's scoring streak to 125 straight games. <laughs> Number 42, Alty Taylor, then was tasted by the hard-bitten purple people eaters. Bob Bryant picked up what was left, and Roy Winston gave him a hand carrying it into the end zone. But the play was nullified for a forward lateral. The Vikings built a 14-3 halftime advantage, but managed only four first downs in the first half, two by penalty, and in the game, the offense collected only seven first downs. The Lions got their chance to score when Lem Barney picked off a Gary Quazzo pass and returned it into Viking territory. Bill Munson then found Larry Walton alone in the end zone and the Lions had their only touchdown of the day. After that, it was all Vikings, all defense, all day. Number 88, Alan Page spiked this attempted punt. The ball rolled out of the end zone and Page had a safety. The game's most unusual play left the ball laying free in the end zone after being touched by Detroit's number 83, Jim Mitchell. Jim Lindsay covered it in purple. And the Vikings were black and blue champs for the fourth consecutive year, extending their dominance over the Lions to eight straight games, this time 29 to 10. When the NFL schedule was announced, it was calculated by more than one expert that the most difficult season belonged to the Philadelphia Eagles. And after five straight losses, the poor Eagles were considered by some to be the worst team in the NFL. But since that time, things have changed. One of the ways the Philadelphia Eagles have changed is that Ed Kayat, their new head coach, has a winning record. In their last eight games, the Eagles have won five, lost two, and tied one. And a victory over St. Louis last Sunday would clinch third place in the NFC East. The Cardinals did their part by handing over the ball in their first two possessions of the day. And the Eagles took a quick six to nothing lead. Bill Bradley's interception was his 11th of the year, breaking his own Eagle record and recording pro football's highest single season total in the past seven years. The only spark for the Cardinals was ignited by Pete Bethers, passed to number 85, a five foot nine inch blur named Mel Gray. For the rest of the afternoon, the view was not so pleasant for St. Louis quarterbacks Jim Hart and Pete Bethard, who combined for only eight completions in 25 attempts with four interceptions. For the second straight week, quarterback Pete Lisk had the Eagle offense performing up to accepted pro standards. 
This completed 15 of 23 passes for over 200 yards and a total offense of almost 400 yards. Lisk threw to six different receivers. Number 46, Lee Bogus, is a rediscovered threat coming out of the backfield. Wide receiver Ben Hawkins, number 18, has been making clutch catches from the outside. Lisk defeated a Cardinal Blitz with one of the year's easiest touchdowns. A simple lob to speedy Harold Jackson, number 29. Another of Philadelphia's rediscovered receiving threats. But the man who thrilled the fans the most was kicker Tom Dempsey, who drove through four field goals, one from 54 yards. Like Bradley, Dempsey for the second straight week had broken his own Eagle record. And the supercritical Philadelphia fans gave Dempsey and the Eagles an ovation that none of them will soon forget. The Greenbirds had whipped the Redbirds for the second time this year, and the destinies of the two teams seem to be winging in very different directions. Well, Tom, your old Eagles have really come on strong lately, haven't they? They have, Pat, and how about the Giants? They've had some tough times, huh? They've really had their troubles. They've won only four games, and last week they ran into those blazing Dallas Cowboys. I don't feel bad about that. Very few people, if any, have done much against Dallas lately. Two former New York Giants got together for a reunion in Yankee Stadium as Alex Webster's Giants met smiling Tom Landry's Cowboys. The Giants have had a difficult year, and they could manage only one offensive touchdown against the rugged Cowboys as number 10, Fran Tarkenton connected with number 85, Don Herman. The Giants defense added a second New York touchdown in the fourth period as number 45, Pete Athos, intercepted a Craig Morton pass for a touchdown. But Giant highlights were scarce as the Dallas doomsday defense bullied and buried the frustrated New York quarterbacks. On this play, you will see the shattering impact of a safety blitz by number 41, Charlie Waters. The Dallas defense is a stingy manhandling monster that has inflicted pain on enemy quarterbacks all year long. While it was a long afternoon for the Giants' offense, Dallas Roger Staubach enjoyed one of his finest days. Roger the Dodger, the NFC's leading passer, evidently didn't appreciate his New York welcome as he bombed the Giants right out of Yankee Stadium. Twice, Staubach found swift Bob Hayes, number 22, for long-range touchdowns. The first connection was good for a 46-yard score. And on the second, Staubach launched a rocket to Hayes for 80 yards, the longest touchdown pass of the year in the NFC. Staubach has been the number one quarterback since the start of Dallas' six-game winning streak, but he has had lots of help. Number 35, Calvin Hill, is an all-purpose back who has it all, the hands, the speed, and the power. And the former Yale great scored twice against New York. But Hill is only one of two locomotive running backs that Staubach can call on. Number 33, Dwayne Thomas, opened the season as Dallas' most outspoken orator. But now he has put his true talent to use. Thomas just might be the most gifted power speed runner in the game. And with Calvin Hill as his partner, trying to stop the Dallas attack is like standing in front of a runaway freight train. The 42-14 victory lengthened the NFL's longest current win streak and assured the Cowboys of a playoff berth. 
with an overpowering defense and a truly awesome offense, the team that has never won the big one may just run away with it all this year. Those Cowboys are going to be mighty rough in the playoffs, Pat. This year just might be the one they keep calling next year in Dallas. Speaking about next year, uh, how about our selections? Uh, I am riding pretty high right now. I'm 17 and 10, and you're almost out of it. But I still have a mathematical chance. Right. I, I won't concede yet. <laughs> what about the two big ones? Uh, Pat, you're going to be out in San Francisco for Detroit. What about it? Well, Detroit, of course, is out of it now, eliminated. San Francisco has to win. They played very well, I think, against Atlanta last week. Got to go with the 49ers. I stayed with Detroit a long time. I'll stick with them through this one, too. Okay. Philadelphia at New York? I got to go with the Giants, I know, and you got to take the Eagles, I'm right? I'm dedicated to green and white, okay. Okay. At any rate, we'll be back next week to show you what happens. I'm Pat Summerall. And I'm Tom Brookshire. We'll see you next week. Promotional consideration for ground transportation provided by Budget Rent-A-Car, who rents the Buick Opal and other fine cars. This Week in Pro Football has been brought to you by the 1972 Buick. Something to believe in. And by Hager, the Slacks people. We make everybody look good. This program has been a color feature presentation on the Hughes Sports Network.